Architecture and music are all around us, so much so that they are often invisible. Architecture is often referred to as frozen music, and the link between them has long been recognized. In terms of form, structure, proportion, and acoustic properties. Equally important in both arts, though, is mood. How does a song make us feel? How does a building make us feel? I'm Seth Bosted, and this is Songs About Buildings and Moods. When you think of Milwaukee, the first thing that might just come to mind is beer. And it's no wonder. Milwaukee was the largest beer brewing city in the United States for decades, and no brewery was larger than Pabst. At its height, the sprawling Pabst complex in Milwaukee produced more than a million barrels of beer a year. Now owned by Jim Hertel, much of the original complex still stands, and its architecture, mostly designed by resident architect Otto Strack, reflects Milwaukee's German heritage with a medieval fairy tale castle design complete with crenellated parapets, fanciful turrets, and spiky spires on slate roofs. To say it's impressive is kind of the understatement of the year. I joined Jim and composer Kristen Ellenwood for a beer in the banquet hall that once held Captain Frederick Pabst's office. This place inspires people in various ways, and uh, the more creative people are, the more this place seems to inspire. Mm -hmm. How did it inspire your music, Christian? Well, there are so many layers of history here, and that's manifested in the architecture. I mean, you have these towers and turrets that take you uh, all the way to Germany, but then there's this solid connection with the, the manufacture of, of this marvelous beverage. So you have, in the very air around the place, uh, this, this feeling of, of toil and, and human striving. But also interesting for me as a composer is that the bu building began as an elementary school, or as a school, the Jefferson School of District 2. And if you go into parts of the building, you'll notice these big, huge, wide staircases with uh, huge windows. And it, it, it tells you that you're in a, you know, a, a schoolhouse. Um, and I, I heard these echoes of 19th century school children's feet. Um, so I, you know, all of this kind of found its way into the composition and all these layers. Uh, and that kind of mixture of energies in history led to the title Confluence because it's all these things coming together that I experienced. There is a great history. It goes back to 1844, right across the street. And a lot of people don't know, we call ourselves the best place because it was the best brewery, making the best beer the first 45 years. Then it finally became Pabst in 1889. And you know, Pabst Blue Ribbon Beer has never won a Blue Ribbon. Mm -hmm. Never won, not for their beer. Their uh, Percheron horses won some Blue Ribbons. <laughs> but it was the Chicago World's Fair. They won a gold medal. And then they started to tie silk Blue Ribbons around every bottle of select beer that won the gold medal. But people didn't say, give me a select beer. They'd say, give me another one of those Blue Ribbon beers. And everybody kept calling it the Blue Ribbon beer. And that's how it became Pabst Blue Ribbon beer. Oh, wow. Never won a Blue Ribbon. <laughs> well, maybe you know, there's still time. Maybe, yeah. Maybe they could win one somewhere. It's still won winning gold medals. It entered into a county fair, of course, to get the Blue Ribbon. But <laughs> um, Jim, talk more about, uh, you know, this, this, I mean, Pabst, everybody knows what Pabst is. I mean, so we're talking about what I assume was, you know, the schoolhouse, the little brewery across the street, and then it becomes this ginormous beer company, hipster favorite, all of that stuff. Can you talk about that, that history for us? Boy, I'll, I'll try to sum it up. We do the history about 20 times a week here, but the short story is, again, it started as best, 
becomes Paps with Captain Paps, which was actually third generation. And it burns down across the street in 1879, and they built the building that we're in in 1880. They buy the school in 1890, and then Captain Paps' office is behind us right here. He passes away just past the turn of the century, one of the five richest men in the world. Not just brewing, but banking and real estate. He owned what is now Times Square in New York. Every major city had a nice Pabst Hotel with a restaurant serving his product. So quite the story. And Pabst and Schlitz were number one and two for about 100 years from about 1874 to about 1974. The two of them were duking it out with Budweiser and Coors and this little upstart called Miller. Philip Morris bought them and brought in Miller Lite and that's when Miller took off and Bud and Coors and then Schlitz and Pabst finally in the 1970s began a demise 85 hostile takeover, 96, they shut the brewery down, and it looked like Pabst Beer was going to go away. All of a sudden, Portland, Seattle, hipsters, <laughs> getting PBRs for a dollar a can or two dollars a tall boy instead of a six dollar microbrew that's spread across the country. All of a sudden, all the hipsters were drinking PBR again because you could get like 30 cans for $15.99. It was like 50 cents a can. And then it's been firming up and firming up until, and now Pabst not only owns Pabst, but I'll tell you, Pabst volume eclipses all the rest of the brands they own. They even have Ching Tao in China, Primo in Hawaii, Pabst. Those are Pabst beers. And, and Miller oh, brews huh, all the beer, Pabst owns them. So you get a Schlitz, owned by Pabst, <laughs> brewed by Miller. That's a great segue. <laughs> Christian, you wrote a wonderful piece. Thanks so uh, much. I mean, I, I think it fits the space in so many ways and, and it's, it's upbeat and rhythmic, but you're talking about kind of, you know, the, the ghosts of the past. I, I, to me though, the piece is, it's, it's really colorful and, and vibrant. How, how do you um, rectify all of that? Well, I think what I tried to do musically is to reflect um, the past through the lens of the present. So when you listen to the piece, you'll hear melodic writing and some harmonic vocabulary that comes right out of 19th century, century Germany um, to kind of reflect what I feel from the architecture here. But that's all through the lens of odd meters. The, the musicians handled that challenge particularly well because I think I change meter every couple bars. Um, but I, I happen to be a, a fan of, of lopsidedness and asymmetry and you see that in this building too. There's not a part of this building that I could divide evenly in half and have, you know, any feeling of symmetry at all. It's filled with these towers and turrets and crenellations. You know what I like listening to it because I was listening as you guys were filming, and it, it had like it, there were parts where you just felt like there was a little, I'll say, turmoil, or you know, like yeah. it was getting nice and then like a storm was brewing, if you will. And that's so much the story of what we went through here to persevere. I mean, there was talk of tearing this whole place down. 28 historic buildings, most of them turn of the previous century. Most of them are 1800s. And there was talk of tearing them down and then saving them and then maybe losing them again. And then our trials and tribulations here, oh, we're gonna get it, oh, we're not. Oh, yes, we are, oh, no, we're not. It, I felt that in the music, this roller coaster ride that has ended up with a beautiful ending. You feel like you're back in Munich when you're here, you know, just Gemiklikite, like uh, Oktoberfest. And when you're there, it's just all about fun. It's just food and drink and music and merriment. That's what the best place is. Gamiklikai. Food, drink, and music. Can't beat that.
I fell in love with the Driehaus Museum from the first time that I stepped foot in it uh, years ago. I mean, the moment you walk in the door, you just know that you're leaving the regular world behind you. You're entering this special place. The level of detail is it's just incredible. I mean, everywhere you look, there is something beautiful. And as I was choosing the buildings for the first few episodes of Songs About Buildings and Moods, I knew immediately that Dree House was going to be one of them. I was originally thinking, uh, at least here in the initial run of buildings, I wouldn't be one of the composers. I, I would stay out of it. I'd just uh, be the, the producer. Uh, the curator, I would choose other composers, let them choose the sites they wrote for. But when I met with the director of the museum, Anna Mushi, I learned more about its past. She started telling me stories about the people who have lived there. And well, I started hearing music and I knew I had to write an original piece for this special place. And I was very grateful that Anna was so supportive of the project. When you walk into this space today, you walk into it in the same way that you were meant to walk into it back in 1883. The emphasis was on the sensual, the emotional, the beautiful, and it's a space that's meant to inspire you in just that way. The walls are meant to do the talking. The walls still have the voices of all these hands that built the house, the people that lived in the house. It's the second home the Nickersons lived in on this property. The first home was taken down by the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. So they were terrified of fire. Something is transformed in this house when there's music present. The space sings. To have music composed for this space is really something quite special and it turns the place into something spectacular and different than when it's empty. There were a lot of different directions that I could have gone when writing music for the Driehaus Museum. There, there's an incredible array of styles of art, of regions from whence the art comes. But for me, musically, I didn't go with any of that. I went with this idea of the house as a sanctuary. This idea, which is that Samuel Nickerson really had deeply ingrained fear of fire. So when this place was built as a fireproof refuge, I can't not react to that as a composer. Where everything comes from emotion, where everything comes from uh, you know, that kind of uh, feeling, that is something that I'm gonna just hone in on immediately. So the piece opens with these high harmonics that are played tremolo, where he's vibrating the string. I had them as a harmonic, which means there's very little fundamental pitch, so it gives it this glassy, kind of otherworldly quality. And to me, that is, it, it, it's this kind of clarion call. It's beckoning you out of, of the mundane world into this sanctuary. And then I wanted to kind of create the atmosphere of the space as well. So that is in the, the bass clarinet, which lays down this kind of atmospheric carpet of sound throughout the work. That to me, at least, there's a warmth to the bass clarinet that I think is reflected in the, the dark tones. There's not a lot of light in this space, and so I, I like those dark tones in the bass clarinet to kind of reflect that. And then the violin has this kind of melancholic melody. Just to me, when I think about anything that's over 100 years old or, or a house where, where people used to live, there's always this kind of feeling for me of, of melancholy. So that's reflected in the violin. And those three elements are present all the way through the piece. To walk into the Richard H. Treehouse Museum is truly to leave the everyday world and step into a place of magic. And I hope that my piece of music is part of that experience from the moment that the doors open. Yeah.